Um, hi, I'm Molly DeBlanc. Thanks for coming to hang out with me for the next hour. I'm going to spend most of this time talking about myself, so I hope you find me interesting by the end of this. Um, or at least, I hope you're not bored of me by the end of this. Um, my clicker isn't on. Uh, this session is called Insecure Connections, Love and Mental Health in Our Digital Lives. Um, so as a content warmi warning slash disclaimer here, one thing is I'm going to be reading all the text on these slides um, in case anyone has problems reading them or if you're watching a video later and you just have poor video quality. Uh, not that the recording itself will have poor video quality. I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, so this talk contains sensitive topics including delusional disorders, depression, romance, and suicide. I think romance is probably the most delicate of all of these topics. Um, if you find this triggering or upsetting, don't hesitate to leave the room or turn off the video at any point. We all need to take care of ourselves first. So I'm Molly and I, uh, I'm a Debian developer. I am a contributor. Uh, uh, I'm on the board of the Open Source Initiative. I'm the campaigns manager of the Free Software Foundation. Uh, and above all, I'm a free software activist. I like to bike, I like to climb. I like to bake and cook. Um, and so I have all these things in my life. I wear a lot of different kinds of hats. Um, and in one of these hats, especially related to my free software activism, I spend a lot of time traveling. One of the places I've traveled is England. Uh, I, England is kind of a weird example when I want to talk about my experiences as a person who travels because I only ever go there for two reasons. I go there either because I'm in love or I'm crazy. Um, I pick both of these terms very carefully and intentionally. I want to talk a little bit more right now about what I mean when I say I'm crazy. I have bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar disorder is exemplified by having uh, periods of depression, hypomania, uh, mania and psychosis. Those are some of the symptoms that some pr one might exhibit. Anxiety is also common. Sometimes people have comorbidities. A comorbidity is when you have another condition that goes along with your diagnosis that's related or similar uh, or just also impacts your life. Um, 20, uh, 30 to 40 percent of people with bipolar disorder self-harm. Um, they injure themselves uh, in a number of different ways. Cutting and burning are two very common examples. Um, and these are things that they do to deal with their anger, their depression, lack of control that they have. 50% uh, 50 of people with bipolar disorder attempt suicide at some point in their lifetimes. Um, and there's an estimate of 15 to 30% total uh, mortality rate among people with bipolar disorder. Uh, one to three percent of the general population has bipolar disorder. That number is from Wikipedia. Um, so take that one with the grain of salt. I have citations for all the rest of these statistics. If you're curious about them, they're in my notes, so I can't read them right now. Um, I wanted to use this slide again because it took me a really long time and a lot of practice to draw that map of England. So I want you all to take a moment to, like, to have the opportunity to appreciate it. Um, so England is a place that I've gone to when I've been depressed. Um, because uh, for me personally, one of the things that happens is uh, in the winter I go through extreme periods of depression and the weather in England is better than the weather in Boston where I live, uh, usually in January and February. So I figure if I'm going to be debilitatingly depressed, I might as well do it where uh, there's a lot of tea and the weather is better. Um, the last time I was really debilitatingly depressed, I went and I went to England. I was so depressed, I puked in the Tate Modern. Um, uh, but I was lucky to have people there uh, who wanted to help take care of me during this period. Love is another condition that a uh, number of us have suffered through uh, or enjoyed, maybe. I mean, sometimes bipolar disorder is also a little enjoyable, though it's something we're nervous to admit. 50% of adults in the United States are married uh, and um, 18 million unmarried U.S. residents live with a partner. Um, I apologize for my statistics being predominantly U.S. based. I didn't know how to find them for Sweden. Um, so if anyone is like really up on the 
statistical organizations of different European countries, that would be super cool, and please tell me later. Um, so one could argue that more than half of the adults in the United States are in love. That's an argument, and I like to think it's true, but who really knows? Um, there's also one billion Tinder swipes per day. Uh, this was in, I think, 2007 or 2012, um, which is quite a few, uh, if you think about it. Um, so it's not just that people are in love and that's a thing that they deal with, but it's that they are searching for it as well, even if they're not already participating. Um, love and bipolar disorder and mental health conditions in general, it turns out, are very similar to one another. Uh, they can cause feelings of elation. We might decide to spend all day in, on the couch, wrapped up in a blanket, watching the Great British Bake Off, um, especially uh, if you're either doing it with someone else or doing it by yourself in the dark. Um, you can't sleep, you have trouble sleeping, um, and you have racing thoughts. Uh, you have trouble focusing on things. You find yourself distracted. You find yourself thinking about all sorts of things that make the rest of your life difficult to live. Um, you spend money you don't have, and you annoy your friends. It turns out you annoy your friends a lot when, you're having a mental, when you have a mental health condition or when you're in love. Um, Robin Dunbar, the evolutionary anthropologist, says that in general in our lives we can have five close relationships. Um, and in this case, a close relationship is defined as someone that we can look to for support during periods of emotional or financial distress. Uh, so when somebody enters a significant lifelong relationship, that number drops from five to four. Uh, which means not only, it's not just that you lose one friend actually, or one support person, you lose two of them. Um, and then one of them is replaced by your new partner. Uh, friends, and I, I use the term friends here um, because I think it's great and ideally your lover is also your partner. Um, our friends are our support networks and they're super important. They provide us with the infrastructure we need to like get through being in love, to develop our ideas, to get through our mental health conditions. For me, they've been instrumental in managing my bipolar disorder. Um, and technology has really enabled the building of these strong relationships, especially for me. Um, our people that we have with us are our networks. We carry them all the time. Um, I currently don't have mine in my pocket, which is a little disconcerting. Uh, currently, it's sitting on this table. Um, and I'm quite glad that it's there. Um, so we carry them with us and we have them available whenever we need them, right? So uh, Margaret Cho once said that if you're on a date and you really like someone, feel free to text them when one of you goes to the bathroom. Um, and that's the kind of thing you can do when you have technology and it's the kind of thing that provides the opportunity for connection. Uh, one of the other things that technology provides us with, especially when we're talking about mobile communication, is it gives us the opportunity to talk in slightly more anonymous contexts. It's easier, for me at least, it's a lot easier to talk about delicate issues when I don't have to physically form the words, when I don't have to talk to someone in person, when I don't have to look at them, when I can instead go over my sentences and structure it, make sure my ideas are what I want to be communicating. Um, uh, there's an organization called Samaritans. They provide suicide helplines. Um, one of the things that they've also been experimenting with is by providing texting services. And these texting services, I don't know how successful they are, but I think the idea of them is just so delightful because it gives people the opportunity to, um, uh, it gives people the opportunity to participate and to reach out without having to make a call. Um, and People being interested in making phone calls is something that is decreasing. Fewer people are interested in talking on the phone than they used to. Um, uh, texting Samaritans, uh, access to it. Um, it also just lowers the bar because texting is a lot easier. You can do it while doing something else. It doesn't have to be controlling all of your time. But also we've created a society 
uh, well, we've created societies where it's much more acceptable to take your phone out in the middle of a conversation and share a little something to someone else uh, to check the time. And in the case, it's also pretty easy to text someone or to text a helpline and say, hey, uh, I'm having some trouble right now. Um, can you come pick me up? Can you help me? Can I know that you're there? A personal example here is one time uh, I was at work and I started um, disassociating. Uh, disassociating is when you stop feeling connected to your body and you start feeling more as though you're watching it happen. Um, and uh, when I disassociate, I begin to lose the ability to talk. Uh, so for me, it was really great that I could take out my phone and I could text one of my friends and ask them to come pick me up. Uh, so our people form our networks. Our networks provide us with the things that we need. Um, this is actually a model of my network. Um, I think group chats are really amazing and provide a great opportunity for us to be connecting in more ways. Uh, so two tools I use personally are Signal um, and WhatsApp. I actually am not using WhatsApp at the moment. Um, when I drew this, uh, one of my support s like systems was on WhatsApp uh, and in fact at a time refused to be on Signal. Um, but that has since switched uh, and now those communications uh, are through Signal instead. So one of the things that WhatsApp and Signal both provide is they provide us with encrypted communication. They create these special kinds of spaces where we can be communicating with one another because they're providing us with a unique set of tools. Uh, these tools create safe spaces, right? They create spaces where we can say with confidence that the things we're communicating with one another are being protected. Something I particularly like about Signal is disappearing messages. Um, I'm surprised that I haven't heard more about disappearing messages being used for sexting, um, but I think that's really the future of it. Uh, disappearing messages allow you to set a time limit before a message is deleted, and actually you can delete a message uh, after you send it at any point whether you want to remove it or you, whether you want to remove it from poster posterity or whether you want to just like kind of try to make sure that the other person doesn't see it in the first place. Um, uh, so those are two really great tools provided by Signal. Um, and one of the things that I think personally is really great about Signal uh, is that it's a piece of software that respects my rights as an end user, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, so, I like to think of my group chats especially, but my conversations in general, as being in these cozy little places. Maybe there's a fireplace, we're sitting around in chairs. Um, and I know that the things I'm saying to people are just between us. Uh, and that that's what, A, in some ways makes them special, but it also makes sure that what we're saying to one another is something that's just between us. These sorts of spaces can help us, whether we're in love and trying to form the ideas behind that, or whether we're in bad moods, whether we're having problems, um, when we're not feeling well, when we're having episodes. Uh, someone I know was going through a manic episode, and during this time, uh, the rest of uh, their support network formed a signal group chat which enabled them, which enabled us to coordinate different points of care to make sure that they weren't alone, to simultaneously all check in with one another about what was going on and about like the health status of this person that we cared about. Um, and because we were using Signal, in addition to like the convenience of the group chat system, in addition to knowing that when I traveled abroad, I would still have access to this community of people, um, I knew that we would be doing so with the technology and the conversations encrypted. Oh, one of the other things that technology gives us uh, is when we're sad, especially, but also when we're happy and when we're in love, we need the ability to envision the future. Um, one of the things that happens among uh, depressed youth uh, and trans youth, trans youth is a very good example, um, is they are provided with spaces on the internet and in their conversations where they can explore their identities and they can find out who they are. 
Um, they can, like, it's, it's safe. It can be safe to say to a friend privately, I really like this person, and this is how I feel like our relationship is going to be developing. Um, but it's also important to be able to remind yourself or have other people remind you that you know, your periods of depression, your periods of hypomania, your even your periods of mania and psychosis are things that you go through and they're things that end and there's a life after them. Uh, so there are a few problems though with technology um, and a lot of, or some of them at least, come down to interoperability. Um, interoperability is the idea that uh, two technologies work together well. Uh, or can work together at all. At least that's the definition I'm using right now. Um, so I want to use emoji as an example. Uh, emoji are super important in the development of relationships. It turns out that when people are more interested in a potential partner, they use more emoji in their conversations. Um, so it turns out that emoji look different on different people, look different, differently, different, look different. Um, they look, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Uh, they look different on different people's phones. Um, when I was working on this, I looked up emoji compatibility charts, uh, and I realized for the first time, like somebody I know would send me this, this like emoji that to me was like two people kissing. And I was like, that's a really bold social move. Interesting. Um, but it turns out that on their phone, it was just like two little blobs with a heart between them. Um, uh, another case is uh, I have a friend who would send me this face that always looked embarrassed to me and I just thought, oh God, I said something terrible and I made them uncomfortable. Um, but it turns out on their phone it was like this big happy smile um, and that for them it was sharing, like, so in both of these cases it's people sharing different kinds of emotions that we can't interpret because we're having this issue with the interoperability. Um, there's also interoperability of file types. Uh, I know someone who had a brain injury. A brain injury is, is like serious trauma to your brain. Um, different kinds of side effects that you get out of it is you can have personality changes. You can become angry uh, regularly all the time. You can be, depression is super common, the development of anxiety. Uh, but one of the biggest, most common things that happens is you lose memory, like you become unable to build new memories or you have trouble developing, remembering things from the past. Uh, so this person I know, what they did was they had an iPad and they used their iPad to remember everything. They used it to keep track of the times that they needed to take their medication, uh, when they were supposed to eat meals, because knowing when you're hungry might not always be the easiest thing. Uh, knowing the people in their lives when people were coming to visit, but also like just kind of keeping track of everything going on. So when they updated their iPad, uh, which uh, I don't remember if it was a forced update or an optional update, but th there are more forced updates these days. Um, they lost the ability to access their note files. Uh, and these note files had been what they'd, what they'd been using to build themselves, to remember themselves, uh, and to have a strong interaction with the rest of the world. Um, so there are some other ways that technology comes into play in our lives, especially in building relationships. Um, if you've ever watched something with somebody else streaming, suddenly you're building a relationship and a shared experience around a technology. Um, if you're doing it where you're in two separate places, especially if you're uh, trying to sync your videos by starting them at the same time, for example, uh, like then you're dealing with another layer of technology fitting into the conversation when you're looking at the security of your internet connection, whether that's working, um, when uh, you're dealing with lag times, or when you're dealing with like small differences between how your web browsers are working. Uh, what somebody I know did to try to compensate for this is um, he developed a piece of software that worked with VLC player to sync two copies of, to sync two editions of VLC so that one person could pause it um, 
uh, and that would also pause it on the other people's screen, and this worked uh, in both directions. So it turned the remote viewing experience from something that you kind of had to try to make work together to something that actually just worked. Um, it created for them a new type of shared experience that made them feel more personally connected to one another. Um, buying people presents uh, or buying things in general uh, is something that many of us do significantly online. I know I don't really like going to stores, um, so I enjoy being able to use online tools. Uh, recently, I wanted to impress someone by picking out the perfect book for them. Um, I was like, I'll get them, I'll get them an ebook because that will be better. They they live uh, in the UK. This is a very important detail in this story. So I purchase a ebook on Amazon, and I really don't like using Amazon <laughs> for many reasons, uh, including but not limited to I know that their ebooks all have DRM on them. They have digital rights management or digital restrictions management technology that encumbers and prevents access to them uh, over different times. Um, so I bought this book and I had Amazon send it to this person. And Amazon said, oh, well actually they can't access it because you bought a US edition and not a UK edition. So I thought, okay, I'll buy a UK edition instead. Like this is annoying. Um, actually even before I bought the UK edition or I went to do that, uh, hint, something happens there. Um, before I went to buy the UK edition, uh, I was talking with the customer service people at Amazon and they said, oh, well, what we can do instead is we can give you a, a card, like a, a gift card, um, and you can use that gift card, uh, like you could give it to them or you could use it yourself. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I can give them this gift card, uh, and that's at least me kind of participating in this process a little bit still. Um, like, I don't like giving gift cards, but it's better than nothing here. So it turns out that they actually couldn't use the gift card either, because um, the gift card only worked on US Amazon. The gift card was in USD. <laughs> um, uh, so that didn't work. And then I thought, OK, <laughs> now I'm going to try to just buy the book on UK Amazon. Um, so I go to do that, and it, it turns out that if I'm logged into Amazon, I can't even view what ebooks are on the UK site because I can't purchase one from being outside of the UK. Uh, and what's interesting is for some reason I have a UK Amazon account. I don't know why. Um, oh, it is automatic. Oh, I thought it wasn't, and it was like really cool that I had done this thing. Well, well, <laughs> that's boring. Um, so I have, so I log in, but I can't view the prices of ebooks. They don't show up at all when I look for them. Um, so I have to open up a private window to find the prices of ebooks, and I can't purchase one without logging in. And once I log in, I lose access to that. Um, so suddenly my options are uh, ask somebody else to do this, give up, or try to figure out uh, another financial exchange. So. In the end, I purchased a gift card for the exact amount of the books. Um, and because this was for a British person, it was a little embarrassing because now they knew exactly how much the gift cost. And while that's a uh, faux pas in many places, I'm under the impression that talking about money in England is like especially bad. No, oh, I see a head shake there, so maybe not. Um, uh, and this was, this was a problem that I had, and this was this long, drawn-out process that really came down to the fact that I couldn't purchase this book, uh, I couldn't download it myself, um, uh, and I couldn't send it to them um, through any medium. And this was because of the restrictive technologies that had been placed on the file. Uh, something else that we do for each other is we build playlists. Um, uh, there's like the modern mixtape that we make for each other where we make a playlist in something like Spotify or YouTube. Um, and when we do that, we're putting our way that, we're putting this gift we have made for someone in the hands of a company, uh, of another actor, who now has the ability to take that away from them at any point. 
Uh, it has the ability to take down the videos or the songs, to cycle those things out, and to remove your opportunity to share this thing that you built with another person. Um, I actually still have the CD uh, at my parents' house of the first mixtape somebody ever made me. Um, and if I want to go through the nostalgia of being 15, I don't know why anyone would want to remember being 15. Um, but if I want to do that, I could listen to it. And I could either do that from the perspective of like, oh yeah, these songs were great in the early 2000s. Um, or I could do it from the perspective of like remembering what young love feels like. Um, remembering that excitement of this kind of gift. Uh, so that's something I'm able to do with it because it's this piece of technology that isn't restricted with the kinds of tools that we have now and that we're using all the time on files, especially on streaming files. Um, I'm going to talk about Harry Potter now. Harry Potter is very important to me. I'm a big fan. Uh, I've not been to Harry Potter world yet, but I dream about going someday. Um, there's a particular set of DRM-free copies of Harry Potter uh, that a number of people I know actually have. Um, it's read by Stephen Fry. Um, and they're a thing I've listened to a lot. One of the things that happens when you're depressed especially is you spend your time waiting. You're waiting to wake up in the morning. You're waiting to go to sleep at night um, when you can't in many cases. You're waiting for until it's time to do the next thing that you have to do. You're waiting for the next meal. Um, or you're just waiting for the period of depression to be over because that's all you can do to fight it. Um, there is no fighting it at times. So Harry Potter for me was like the first time I listened to the books on tape, having read the books before, uh, it provided me with this kind of comfort. Stephen Fry has a lovely voice. He does voices for all the characters. I recommend them if you have the opportunity to listen. Um, uh, but I suddenly had this piece of comfort with me all the time. Um, I remember listening to it on planes. I listened to it while I was camping. Um, I listened to it in hotel rooms as I was traveling to conferences and for work. Um, so I, I had this copy of this story that provided me with comfort I needed. Um, I consider Harry Potter uh, to be life-saving and not a number of people, uh, I've, I've heard of a number of people saying Harry Potter has been life-saving to them because rather than killing themselves, they uh, wanted to wait to learn how the series ended. But for a number of people I know, Harry Potter is a life-saving technology because uh, it provides them with this source of comfort. It provides them with this thing that they need while they're waiting or while they're depressed. It provides them with the feeling of not being alone um, because they have this human voice talking to them. Uh, this is, uh, so Abilify, or also known as aripiprazole, um, is a drug used for treatment. Um, it's a conjunctive therapy, so it's used if you have other, if you're taking other, especially antidepressants or mood stabilizers. Um, and when you are taking a Billify My Sight, you have, um, well anyway, so uh, Abilify, or Abilify is the regular one. Abilify My Sight is a digital drug. Uh, a digital drug specifically is something that has some kind of technot, like, computing technology built into the medication. Uh, in this particular case, there's a sensor on it. Um, so when you take a pill, uh, the sensor becomes, like, is, is metabolized as well um, during the process. And you wear another sensor uh, on your body, so that sensor picks up where in your body and where in the metabolization process the Abilify is at. Now, that then talks to an app, and your doctor has access to the information in this app. Uh, there are lots of problems with this, it turns out. Um, 
And I don't know how it's been tested in the field, but from a conceptual standpoint, what we see with something like this is we see a possibility for an insecure space between what's being communicated. You're seeing a lack of data control. And you're seeing this especially like around something that is hugely stigmatized, right? When, um, when people, well, when some people, some types of people, uh, perform violent acts, like publicly violent acts, uh, their mental health comes into the conversation. They talk about whether they are medicated or have been medicated. Um, you can lose relationships with people. I know a number of people who have had marriages and romantic relationships of all types end and break up because of their mental health issues. So suddenly you're putting this thing that lets people know one of your biggest secrets, uh, if it's a secret, um, but lets people know one of those like really intimate things about you, it's putting it out into the world into a way that you have no control over. Uh, and to me, that's really scary. So a lot of this stuff that I've been talking about comes down to privacy. Right, so when we want to build our private spaces, whether we're talking about the privacy of our data, the privacy of our bodies and our bodily autonomy, um, we're looking at what enables that, and what enables that is security, right? So when we have uh, ways that information is being communicated across systems, across computers, between people, between organizations, um, we need to know that uh, it's private, and the only way to do that is by knowing that the way it's moving uh, is secure. Now, security cannot exist without software freedom. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why this is the case. Um, some of the ones that I find interesting, especially, are the idea of accountability in design and development. Um, something that comes up, this is a kind of like a data issue, um, rather than explicitly uh, like a, a software issue, um, which is people, uh, companies or developers when working on things will keep personal data in different files, like personal data for themselves, sometimes including passwords. Um, there was one particular data breach, uh, I think it was Uber, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, where what happened was uh, some developers had left um, their passwords uh, in their repos, uh, in their files, and when this was going on, uh, somebody got into their system, somebody saw these passwords, someone were able to log in, and then they were able to steal very large amounts of data. Um, so one of the things that you get when you have software freedom, when you have software that is accessible, that people can study, that people can look at, that people can modify and change and use and share, uh, you have a new level where developers are suddenly need to be more accountable to their users. Uh, I think that's one of the most interesting cases because it's one that I didn't really think about for a long time. I thought about people studying code. I thought about uh, and people do study code, uh, it turns out. Um, I know someone who, for a while at least, had this hobby of getting IoT devices and figuring out where there were insecure parts of them and then writing Amazon reviews. Um, uh, so people, people will engage in that. Um, security through obscurity doesn't work, right? Um, by when you have software freedom, when you have the idea that software and code is accessible, um, uh, you're putting it out in the open, right? And by merely hiding those tools that are, that's, that are supposedly making your software secure, uh, what you're doing is you're putting them in a place where if somebody finds a security vulnerability, there is no way for them to fix it. Uh, the, a number of security vulnerabilities are worth a lot more on an open market than they're worth uh, reporting as bugs. Um, so you're kind of trusting people who find them to do that reporting. Uh, so you don't really know if you can be trusting these technologies. 
right? Trusting technology comes down to consent. Whenever we're using something, we should be consenting to use it knowing as much as possible. You know, I think software freedom and user freedom, the most important part of it comes down to me being able to know and trust a piece of technology, uh, to be able to use that technology with confidence, right? To be able to consent to using that technology. Um, and the only way that can happen is when that technology is something that I can understand or that someone I trust can understand. It's only possible when I know that there's accountability within the system. Um, so consent comes from user freedom, user freedom comes from software freedom, and software freedom comes from the philosophies, ideas, and licensing behind free and open source software. So the technology that people are building that uh, the technologies people are building that are free and open source are invaluable to this whole conversation. They're what builds it and makes it possible. It makes it possible for me to consent to what I'm doing. Um, but one of the things with all of this, uh, when you're using free and open source software, is you actually still need to trust other people. Uh, and for someone like me who doesn't code, uh, I have to trust people like a number of you who do. I have to trust that you'll be doing those assessments, that you'll be building things ethically, um, that you'll be building things well, uh, and that what you give me and what you tell me is safe is safe. Um, there's still actually a lot of different kinds of things that we could talk about, especially in the relationship between technology uh, and the role technology plays in our lives. Um, proprietary JavaScript is a good example. That's something that uh, I know uh, a number of people care about um, very strongly because proprietary JavaScript is creating these insecurities uh, in your systems and it's something that's running on many websites. Um, we could talk more about DRM and the kinds of things people have lost. Um, we could talk about dating apps. I think dating apps are like a really gr great example of the way technology plays into our love lives, but also the way that like we're not trusting or we shouldn't be trusting the way technology is playing into our love lives. Um, so I, I have to ask at the end of this, like, will free software save the day? You know, I spent a lot of time talking about technology in general and pointing out problems, but I didn't spend a lot of time talking about whether by building ethical technologies or by using ethical technologies, we're going to solve these problems? And the answer is I don't know. Um, and if you know, I would love to hear that. I hope it's the case. I very strongly hope that free and open source software will provide us with this glorious future um, where everybody, uh, is, everybody has access to the resources that I have access to uh, and that the resources I have access to are better and have fewer problems. Like right now, I can't install, s install Signal Desktop on my Debian machine uh, because it doesn't work. So if you know how to do that and you want to find me later and help me with that, that would be super cool. Um, but no pressure, guys. Um, so I ask myself, you know, like, will free software be this be this great democratizing tool? Will it help everybody? Uh, will it help me? Will it continue to help me? Uh, and how, how much does it actually help me? So that depends on you. Um, this means, and, and in you, when I say you, I'm talking to developers, but I'm also talking to the system administrators who help support, uh, the, who help support these systems. Um, I'm talking to the designers who make things look certain ways, who make things uh, usable and accessible. I'm talking to the translators, uh, to the illustrators, to the project managers uh, who just show up for a day and give some advice on how something should be developed um, and better ways for technology to work. The leaders, uh, the people who are doing bug reporting, everyone who's interacting with a piece of software is responsible for building ethical technology. Um, whether we're doing that by making demands or requests from companies that are building proprietary, closed, dangerous, risky software, um, or we're building it ourselves. Uh, so um, the things that you can do is you can think about when you're building something, don't just think about your own needs for it and don't just think about what the requirements are for it, but think about how it fits into a narrative of ethics. Ask yourself, how does this help people? Who is using it? 
Uh, what kinds of needs do they have? I want you to think about me um, and how security and privacy are really important to me, how having adaptive technologies that are easy for me to use uh, are really important. You know, when I have a psychotic episode, when I have an episode of uh, disassociation, I can't easily communicate with people. So being able to quickly type something or to quickly send a message is great, right? Um, when you're looking at uh, people who want to communicate with one another, whether they want to send pictures, think about how those things are being moved around. Um, think about the everyday user, uh, but also think about all the fringe cases. Think about people who have accessibility issues, um, people who don't speak your native language, people who don't speak English especially. Um, I deeply appreciate that I'm able to give this talk in English, by the way, so thank you all for spending years learning my language while I definitely don't speak any of yours. Um, but this is also about you because you're someone who knows about ethics and technology, because you've thought about the ways that these things fit in together. Um, so I hope that you'll go out and like one of the things you'll be doing is in the future you'll be talking with others uh, about these tools. You'll be helping people set up Signal accounts or WhatsApp. Ac WhatsApp is proprietary software. I know this. It uses the op Open Whisper Systems uh, encryption tool, which at least is something. Um, but I will only recommend Signal um, because it's free software. Uh, so like, help people set up these tools, help people understand their technologies, uh, and, and talk to them. Um, talk to companies, talk to your employers, use the tools that you have ex available to you to make sure that the things that you're building are not just ethical, but are taking into account all like the huge range of needs that come from different users. You know, it's our job to raise awareness because we know what's going on. It's our job to talk to others. Um, and it's our job to, like, it's our job to be building this future together, right? Um, we're doing a great job. We have built amazing things. We've built incredible things, right? Free software is in space. How cool is that? Um, like, my favorite Debian anecdote is that the International Space Station has been running Debian. Like, that's so cool. Um, but also, it's really cool that I have IRC and I can talk to my friends all day long and that I have Signal and I can talk to them about terrible things. Um, uh, that I have these ways to share with uh, the people in my life. Um, so we've been doing a great job, but we still can do better, right? Free software is famously hard to use. Uh, so we can do better on that front and we can do better when we're thinking about the tools we're building. So what I really want you to walk away from this with is the idea that everything is actually a technology issue. Um, I do a talk with Karen Sandler uh, from the Software Freedom Conservancy about uh, how everything is a technology issue. Um, so if you're interested in that, there's a cool video. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, but And it's a conversation I'm happy to have. Um, so I want you to have this idea and this understanding that uh, things that we might not think about uh, as ethical technology issues, things that we might not be thinking about as free and open source software issues, in fact are because technology is extremely pervasive. And in any part of our life where we're having a piece of technology, when we're having a piece of computing technology especially, interacting with that, which is basically everything. Like you can't use cash in Sweden, that's what I've learned. Um, and being here, this is my first time here, it's great, I love it, but you can't use cash. Um, like suddenly there's like this whole other layer to computing technology that we're interacting with every day. Um, so that's what I have. Uh, I'd really like to thank you for listening. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you for thinking about what I'm saying. I'd like to thank you for coming here. Uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers of FOSS North for inviting me and helping me get here. Uh, it's been a lot of fun at this conference. Um, my name is Molly DeBlanc. You can find me on Twitter at Emillions. Um, and my slides are CC by SA. Uh, some of these slides are already available on my GitLab account. Um, and the, this will be up soon. So that's what I have. <laughs>